Over the past eight months, we've aired three stories about America's aging nuclear arsenal. Tonight, we thought we would share with you some of the more interesting things we learned along the way. John Yang has that. Our past stories looked at the debate over rebuilding America's nuclear submarines, missiles, and bombs now that much of the current arsenal is reaching the end of its service life. And tonight, to continue our unprecedented look behind the scenes, we meet some of the men and women charged with this great responsibility. Veteran defense correspondent Jamie McIntyre reported these stories for us in partnership with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Our patients, our patients. If the president ever gives the order to unleash nuclear weapons, the men and women whose fingers are on the triggers would hear something like this. It's the sound of an emergency action message. It's only a drill, but in a real-life situation, the highly encrypted message sent to bombers, submarines, and missile crews would tell them which war plan to execute and which targets to destroy. The coded message echoes because it's sent by many different radios around the world to ensure that even if the nation were under nuclear attack, at least one of the messages would get through. The News Hour was granted rare access to America's nuclear warfighters over the past six months. At Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, we spent the day with the airmen who load the B-52 bombers and the crews who fly them. The capability exists on the B-52 only externally. Chief Master Sergeant Lee Robbins is the wing hours. weapons manager. How can you tell how old it is? It's pretty easy. So there's a on the tail number here. If we look underneath uh, the the, the uh, letters AF is uh, 61. So that's when we rolled off the assembly line. That makes this aircraft 19 years older than Major Luke Dellenbach, a B-52 commander and instructor pilot. I asked him about the differences between flying a conventional versus nuclear mission. For a nuclear mission for us, it's very controlled. It's very scripted. The president doesn't want us doing things that we want to do. There's no inventiveness. It's very much you follow the rules and you follow the procedures and guidelines that we have. Uh, for conventional, it's almost the opposite. Uh, we have a lot more flexibility. We can be more innovative. We can hit targets different ways. It's a sobering mission, and the venerable B-52 has been updated with modern avionics to carry it out, even though, as the crew is quick to show us, some non-mission critical systems are an antiquated reminder of its Cold War history. What do we have? So over here we have the oven. It has two different settings, off and 400 degrees. 1960s technology? Still works today. Air up here we have a sextant port. The southern navigation of everything else failed. Do you know how to use a sextant? No. We usually put a GPS engine out of it if we need it. <laughs> While bomber crews typically fly at 50,000 feet above the ground, Smart ship, make my depth 160 feet. The submariners we visited last summer lurk hundreds of feet below the surface. In this case, flying the depths of the Pacific Ocean. Dive, dive. By far the stealthiest leg of the nuclear triad, the submarine's unofficial motto is hide with pride. The USS Pennsylvania's crew spends three months at a time in the cramped confines of the windowless ballistic missile submarine, breathing recycled air and never seeing the sun. That is unless they are among the chosen few who get to go topside while the sub takes on provisions an elaborate and highly choreographed ritual on the high seas in which canvas bags of food and supplies are transferred from boat to boat. While the subs patrol undersea, missileers serve underground. They have to take an elevator 50 to 60 feet down each time they arrive at their jobs. There are 45 launch facilities spread across America's heartland, controlling the intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, buried in silos in fixed known locations. Incoming emergency action message. We got to watch two junior officers practicing running through the lengthy checklist to launch nuclear missiles. To get the launch keys, they must each unlock a padlock. In this training scenario, using unfamiliar locks, a forgotten combination delays a mock launch. In case you're wondering, missileers can't just go rogue, it takes 
four officers in two separate launch facilities to launch a missile after an authentication code is received. You can't help noticing how young America's nuclear warriors are. First Lieutenant Kathleen Fosterling, who commands a two-person missile combat crew, is 27. She works a 24-hour shift eight times a month, waiting for an order she hopes never to receive. I wouldn't say it's lonely. Um, we ha yes, we're, we only work with technically one other person, but we have all the guys topside. We have uh, we talk to the other crews at the other capsules constantly. But our free time, if we have any, not always. Sometimes there's a lot. Sometimes there's not. A lot of people do homework. Um, there's a lot of people in school. Um, we read. We uh, watch TV, watch movies, uh, hang out with each other. It's, it's not so bad. <laughs> Adam 128, launch our closure door open. Do you ever wonder, we ask, what it would be like to have to turn the launch key for real? It's hard to think about it because you don't know what's going to happen in that situation. You just have to do your job and, you know, whatever the outcome is, it is. Weapons Con, you have permission to fire. First Lieutenant Fosterling is not alone. A number of nuclear warriors told us it's very hard to think about what it would be like after the unthinkable happens. Now Jamie McIntyre joins us. Jamie, this was really a remarkable series. You showed us things that we rarely see on television. I have to ask you, what do you take away from this personally? What was most memorable for you? Well, you know, John, one of the things we asked almost all the people that we interviewed was, have you ever thought about what would happen if you actually had to employ these weapons? It's the classic unthinkable scenario. And what we found was that, yes, most of them had thought about it, but they don't dwell on it. I mean, these are military people trained to a mission, and they think about their part of the mission, and there's not a whole lot of... Of, of angst about what would happen if they actually were involved in an all-out nuclear exchange. It was interesting, when we talked to the submarine commander, we said, you know, well, how would you deal with the crew after you've already launched all these missiles and you know that maybe even the end of the world is coming? And he said, well, it would be difficult. Um, hopefully, he said, there'll be some guidance. It's a little, little guidance from the Pentagon on it. And talk about that, because this really is, uh, they're, they're, they are handling the awesome power of nuclear weapons, but it's a job for them. It's their, it's their assignment. It's their day-to-day -day assignment. Well, I mentioned this in the piece, that one of the things that really struck me was how young everybody was and how uh, they're focused on their mission. The, the young first lieutenant that we, uh, that we met in the missile silo, uh, uh, First Lieutenant Kathleen Fosterling. Um, so she's very young and she's commanding this two-person crew, but yet, and she's in this tiny room underground, you know, windowless room every day. Um, and one of the things that struck you is that you had to, you, you see how they personalize their their life. So for instance, those those locks, and you saw the sequence in the in the story where the the training scenario, they can't get the lock open because they're using a training lock. In real life, they all use their own personal padlocks, and she had plastered hers with Hello Kitty stickers, which just seemed to be sort of this juxtaposition of the fact that they're, they're conducting this awesome mission, but at the same time, it is a job, and they just need to have some sort of human interaction and, and think of it as something that they just do every day. Just personalizing their workspace. Yes. Jamie McIntyre, remarkable reporting. Thank you very much. Thank you.